Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to another um, lecture here for thermochemistry. So, um, so thermochemistry plays an important part um, in pretty much every kind of reaction that happens, whether, whether it be like an inorganic reaction or organic reaction or biochemical reaction, um, the amount of energy release, it kind of, uh, it plays a very important role in, um, in our, um, in how energy basically gets transformed, transformed into different forms of, you know, energy for consumption, power in the cell, power in engines, um, industries. So it's a very important topic and I like to stress the importance of it. Um, especially in this last section where we talk about a little more complicated calculations now. Okay, so part three is all about enthalpy. So we're going to talk about enthalpy um, and the enthalpies of formation. So in this class, um, we only touch, about, touch upon, um, so there's enthalpies for um, a variety of different kinds of reactions or processes. But in this class, we're only going to focus on the enthalpy, calculating enthalpies um, from the energy released in the reaction and from uh, standard states of formation of common compounds. So we're not going to focus on any enthalpy changes for any other process. And the only ones I cover today or in this lecture and maybe next week, those will be the only ones um, students will be responsible for. Okay. So enthalpy, um, enthalpy, let's talk about enthalpy. So what is enthalpy? So of a system, a chemical system, um, mainly it's um, referred to as the involving, the breaking and reforming of bonds. So what we're trying to kind of put a number on is the strength of um, a chemical bond that is broken and the chemical bond that is formed between atoms or ions. So that's what um, the enthalpy of reaction will be, is kind of gauging how much energy does, this, does these two reactants have and how much energy is either gained or lost um, by forming products, okay? So for example, the reaction between sodium metal and chlorine gas is very exothermic, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, fast, spontaneous reaction. And it must involve breaking bonds between metal atoms and sodium metal and between chlorine atoms in the gas, okay? So, so what's the driving force for this reaction? Well, you're taking two compounds that are not ions and you're forming a very strong ionic bond, or in this case, we, we say a very um, strong ionic structure of sodium chloride. So sodium chloride is a favorable um, reaction forming from its elements, and that's because the elements by themselves are not very stable, of, are of higher potential energy, whereas the sodium chloride is a much stable state for both atoms involved, okay? So as chemists, we, we care about the energy consumed or released in a chemical reaction, and you know, how can that, um, and you know, how can that play a role in developing new reactions, or developing new processes um, to for our energy needs and for addressing, um, problems in a social setting okay so there's two ways we can measure energy we can do it by using a what i said previously a bomb calorimeter so if you're trying to do a combustion reaction where the pressure is going to uh, there's going to be a really big buildup of pressure and uh, you may see an explosion or um, the pressure can get carried away rather quickly and it's hard to control we use something called a uh, bomb so it's a steel bomb and these things are really heavy, so they will stand um, um, builds up in pressure um, and stuff like that. Um, so where I uh, where I did my grad work, um, we had several of these, and when we did the reaction, we would go up to several um, hundreds. Uh, well, I'm not gonna say hundreds. Yeah, yeah, several hundreds of psi. So think about pounds per square inch. Now think about your car. Okay, your car is probably within like, depending on the size of your tire and what car you drive or truck, you know, within 60 to 30 PSI. So just imagine now going up to several hundreds 
300, 400, 500 psi of pressure. So that's that's a lot. That's a that's a lot of pressure. So when we do these reactions, we need to use a blast shield, which is basically those riot shields you may see um, police carrying um, sometimes in the news. Those you know, like it looks like a very a sturdy gla uh, glass shield. It looks really heavy. So that's essentially what we use too um, to protect ourselves from um, high pressure reactions. So. Um, if people aren't aware, um, in the industry, um, the cheapest way to do chemical reactions is not using fancy reagents, but using ga uh, gases that are dirt cheap and very easy or cheap to manufacture. And usually hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, if you need to reduce or oxidize something, those, those are usually the ways to do it. And um, what we do, we usually do hydrogenations, which is essentially you're bombarding compounds of hydrogen so you you um, remove any double or triple bonds in a compound but um, that's where this kind of bomb carburetor comes into play um, so you have a reaction vessel here but usually um, usually what we do is we have we usually just take the vessel and we're just doing chemical reactions at high pressure. But if you're trying to measure the temperature, you would have something like this in this figure here, a bomb, um, a reaction vessel in the center there, and then you're gonna fill up the chamber with water. So to, able, so to be able to determine how much heat was released um, from the chemical reaction, you need to take the change in temperature between the water and the, uh, the reaction vessel. So that's usually what we do. Um, then we have a thermometer, then we have some electrical connections to ignite the sample. So this is primarily used for combustion reactions. Um, but nowadays, unless you have a um, new compound, usually the combustion data is not very useful these days. I have never done a combustion reaction uh, other than starting my car. <laughs> but uh, no, I've never done one in the lab. So I've never really used a calorimeter since maybe undergrad. But um, we'll be using one, um, not this week, but um, next week when, we, when we're going to measure the energy content of, I think, food. Okay? And then you see that mechanical, like, um, propeller thing. That's a stirrer that helps stir the solution so energy is uniform. So the, um, the energy transfer is uniform through the water. And then we uh, usually have this container here that's insulated, so we're not losing any heat. But um, that's more of an engineering issue. So usually um, we try to choose materials that are insulated and not good conductors. So usually probably this container is probably of some material that does not lose heat um, to the surroundings very easily. So it's not a good conductor of heat, okay? So we talked about this last time, right? Um, when we have a when we have a uh, container like this, it's going to be a situation where the volume's not increasing, right? Because um, this container looks pretty sturdy, and it won't um, let the volume of the container won't be able to change. So this is a situation where we're concerned about the volume, and we don't want the reaction to, you know, explode. So we use a bomb calorimeter to at constant volume to measure the heat change. Okay, but mainly in our class, we will focus on reactions that don't involve a bomb calorimeter. So usually a constant volume calorimeter, and I'm gonna explain what that is right now. Okay, so in our next example, we have a different setup here. So it looks a lot more simple. So this is what we refer to as a coffee cup calorimeter. Because ideally, when you do this experiment in the lab, you use two, what we say, coffee cups or styrofoam cups. So um, now you can have a more sophisticated version, but this is like the DIY version in a lab where you don't have access to, you know, um, high tech materials. So it, it does the, it does it pretty well. Um, so um, we, in this case, it's a constant pressure calorimeter because um, your uh, calorimeter is um, still able um, to expand based on that 
Um, usually, you know, the, the system is not closed off to the atmosphere, so um, some air can leave. Um, usually the cap there or the insulated stopper is usually not on tightly all the way. And sometimes there's pores in the stopper or in your well, whatever you use to seal the container and air can come in and out. So that's a constant volume situation, not constant pressure because um, the atmosphere isn't locked or um, isn't uh, separated from the container like it was in the bomb calorimeter, okay? All right, so we use here, and in this case, we use a styrofoam cup um, to, an, uh, so we use an insulated, uh, a styrofoam cup to hold our reaction mixture. And then we use another styrofoam cup to insulate the system. So to ensure that no heat gets out. So we have a thermometer there to raise the, uh, to detect the difference in temperature. And then we have a stir and that's usually how we do this reaction. Okay. Oh, well, so usually we study solutions. Um, so yeah, so we isolate we isolate the heat exchange between the environment or the air and the you know whatever the whatever uh, other sources of uh, of whatever um, whatever um, and from whatever else can maybe um, absorb heat. So we're trying to insulate it as best as possible. Okay. So um, okay. So that's usually how we do it, and we usually do um, we usually do these in solutions. So we're measuring the difference in temperature of a solution, because you can't really measure the temperature of a uh, solid that easily. So we usually do this in the liquid phase. Okay. All right. So we if we're trying to see how much heat is given off, we. Um, in either vessel, we, we determine the change in temperature first, okay? So the first example above is done in a sealed container so at constant volume, so no work can be done. So the change in energy of the system is basically, it's going to have the same magnitude and sign of the change in energy from the surroundings, okay? So if we did a combustion reaction, um, the energy of the system would lose energy, right? Because um, it's releasing heat, and so the energy from the surroundings uh, would gain heat. But in this case, um, uh, but um, as I've written here, I wrote it as um, one, the system's gaining energy, but um, I don't think it'll be gaining energy if it's a combustion reaction, but this is just a generic reaction, okay? So if the system gains energy, that means the surrounding must have lost energy. Because remember that the total energy of the system and surroundings must equal zero. So in this case, they must be opposite. All right, and like before, we talked about that we can represent the change in energy of the system as the amount of heat given off um, during the process so at cost of volume, since no work is being done. Okay, but then we run into this issue like, oh, remember reactions are usually carried out in beakers or flasks that are open to the atmosphere or, you know, that are not completely sealed off. So um, we say it's a constant pressure. Um, these values are measured at constant pressure. Okay, so when we have a situation when the volume of the system can change, um, the heat supplied or taken from the system um, doesn't, all of it doesn't go into producing a temperature change, right? Some of the heat is used to do work, like we said before. Um, so when this is the case, we, um, when we're doing, uh, when we have a system at constant pressure, we look for the change in enthalpy of the system. So not in the change in energy now, the change in enthalpy. And like energy or total energy, enthalpy is a state function. It doesn't matter um, what path you took to get to the final state. All that matters is what you started with and what you ended with. So the energy of those two states will give us the total energy of that transformation. Okay. So what we can say here is that the change in enthalpy that occurs during a chemical reaction at constant pressure is exactly equal to the heat given off or absorbed by the reaction. So that's pretty useful information for us. Okay, um, 
So we use this calorimeter, um, a constant pressure calorimeter, to collect you know data and to determine delta H for a reaction. So this is the equation we want to focus on here. This one, okay? Okay. Okay, let's see here. All right. Okay, so let's talk more about uh, why we use calorimeters. Okay, so calorimeters are, they're routinely used to determine the calor, uh, calorie content of food. So we'll see this in the lab. So it'll be, it'll be fun. So for example, we try to figure out the energy content of sucrose. Um, we burn in oxygen and the heat release um, is measured. Um, and then we determine the amount of heat measured, uh, the amount of heat released by measuring the temperature of the water and how much it increased the temperature, okay? So for example, sucrose, um, it releases 5,645 kilojoules of heat for every mole. So that's, that's a lot of energy. All right. So this this is a um, this is pretty much the amount of energy that will be supplied or stored by the body once sucrose is eaten daily. Okay. So a soft drink, um, it has 120 food calories or 120 uh, 120 cal uh, big food calories, and that's more than 500,000 joules of energy. So you see how like the energy of the food. Um, they're related to the amount of energy to release when we consume them, which is simply a chemical reaction happening in the body. Okay. So if we consider the cal um, calorie value of one mole sucrose. It's about 1,349 food, uh, food calories. So that's big calories or kcals. And, um, one mole sucrose weighs uh, about 342 grams. So let's imagine here we have a tablespoon of sucrose. It will provide about 20 kcal or four kcal per gram. Um, so that, that supplies a, a, a decent amount of energy um, for us to use to um, you know, carry, on, carry about the day. So either go to work, exercise, or you know, save it for, um, save it for um, uh, as storage, energy as storage. So, um, for example, slow walking it spends about 150 calories per hour. So, you know, so a teaspoon only lasts us eight minutes. So that's why we need a lot of food. Um, um, uh, we need a lot of food uh, to consume. That supplies us with the necessary energy to get through, you know, this class and through lab, um, through long periods of lab. So it's important that we always eat before, you know. Um, doing something for a very long time and like taking a lab course or you know going out for a run or you know uh, having a full day of classes etc okay all right now let's check our understanding here a teaspoon of sugar can provide several calories of energy what does this tell us about the strength of the bonds and the reactants compared to those of the products okay so if we think back to the chemical equation here, we see here that there are, um, so if we can, um, so if it releases, um, releases lots of energy or just energy in general, that means we can state something about the relative strengths of the bonds of the reactants and of those of the products. So. If your delta H value is negative and it releases energy, that means um, we have a very stable product. So th that means is that the bonds in the product are stronger Are stronger than those in the reactants so this reaction is very favorable and we get so much energy from sucrose is because our body can do um, use cellular respiration remember to convert sucrose molecules into co2 water and what, uh, the other byproduct of that is energy a large amount a large amount of energy okay 
So we can oxidize sucrose into carbon dioxide and reduce oxygen to water and that gives us lots of energy. So that tells us that forming the products is more favorable because you form stronger or more stable, stronger bonds or more stable compounds. So the bonds in the product are stronger than those in the reactants. So that's how we would, um, that's how we would kind of interpret that statement there. Okay. So if you release lots of energy or release energy in general, that means the, in a chemical reaction, your products have stronger bonds than your reactants. Okay. Enthalpies of reaction now. Okay. So what are enthalpies of reaction? Okay. So, um, based on the enthalpy value, the value for enthalpy of a chemical reaction, we can classify them into ex and exothermic reactions. So they are reactions. So these are reactions that give off that give off heat to the surroundings. Okay, so let's stop there and I'll pick up where we left off in the next video.